Professor Renfield and the Vampire Puppets. Whitby is famed not only for its beautiful coastline and surrounding moorland, but also its cobbles and supernatural inhabitants. Thanks to Bram Stoker's Dracula, there is not a person in Whitby unaware of the town's many ghost stories and frightful folklore. As a child growing up in and around the British home of the world's most famous vampire, you will have been a part of many playground discussions of what to do if you encountered such a creature. But have you ever heard playground whisperings, or been warned directly of Professor Renfield and the vampire puppets? Many years ago, puppet shows were commonplace around seaside towns, featuring characters Punch and Judy. The two characters were so beloved, they became show staples across the UK. There were very few children, and parents for that matter, that didn't rush to the shows whenever and wherever they appeared. One such puppet show became a regular show on Tate Hill Sands Whitby. A popular spot in the heart of the town, it saw many passers-by every day, and as a result, its audience grew filled with both children and adults laughing along with every story. What made this puppet show better than any other was the craftsmanship of its puppets. In fact, the puppets were the topic of much adult discussion throughout the shows, as they were just so lifelike. Many of the adults would therefore make an effort to compliment the puppeteer for creating such works of art. However, what they didn't know was that the puppeteer's name was Professor Renfield, and he did not create his puppets. No one did. For these puppets were real. They were in fact vampires, that used their naturally small stature to their advantage. Every spring, the puppet shows would appear in the town, while the weather was good and tourist season was beginning. So many people meant so many meal options for these vampires. And so, their humble servant Renfield helped them carry out their evil scheme. Each day, Renfield would take them into the town in their puppet case. There, they would set up the stage and prepare for a new story each day for the paying crowd. When the crowd was a favourable size, the show would begin. As the vampires made jokes, danced and sang, the crowd would laugh and stare in awe. Unaware, the puppets were studying them, searching the crowd for their next meal. Then, when the sun had gone down and darkness covered the sky, the bloodthirsty creatures and their servant would take their silent horse-drawn carriage to the residence of their chosen child, stealing them from their beds and whisking them away into the night never to be seen again. No one knew where they took the children, for no one knew where they came from. However, as children continued to disappear, panicked parents and police searched for answers. The children did not attend the same school, nor live in the same street, or play in the same parks. With every dead end, they closed in on the connection between their missing children their attendance of the Tate Hill Sands puppet show. Soon enough, police joined the large crowd gathered around Professor Renfield's puppet show, and as soon as it ended, made their arrest, seizing the professor and discovering the true nature of his puppets. Whilst the children's location was never revealed, Renfield did tell police what happened to them, the details of which were deemed far too terrible to be repeated. With the culprits apprehended, the town's children could sleep peacefully once again. Until the morning when the townspeople awoke to the news that Renfield and his vampire puppets had escaped. To this day, the townsfolk are wary of puppet shows, and warn their children that Professor Renfield and his vampire puppets may still haunt the town, capturing children and feasting on them. The Whitby Doppelganger 
Vampires are not the only dark beings to walk amongst the living in Whitby, according to local legend. The monstrous creatures and ill-intentioned beings crossing your path is a thought that can send shivers down your spine. The fear they induce cannot compare to the fear of facing your darkest self. Translated from German as Doublegoer, these reflections of ourselves are a twin stranger that have been featured in folklore for centuries. Some tales speak of them as an evil twin and connect them to an alternate universe or mirror world, but most country's folklore instead presents them as a harbinger of death that only disappear once its living twin is dead. Imagine walking down a quiet street and seeing a figure ahead. As you continue on your path, it becomes apparent that the silhouette is moving closer, walking towards you. Hoping the figure to be simply a fellow member of your community heading home, you continue on, staring straight ahead to avoid eye contact. However, the closer you get, the faster your heart beats in your chest, and the anticipation of passing the stranger becomes almost too much to bear. Then, it happens. You reach the same cobbled divot in the path and pass. Your eyes, fixed straight ahead, gaze down towards the floor, and you sigh in relief. This brief moment of peace is fleeting, however, as your thoughts quickly become attuned to your senses. Your breath hitches, and you replay what you saw in your peripheral vision. Were they wearing the same coat as me? Was their hair the same colour and style? The answers are revealed and you come face to face with yourself staring back at you with a sinister smile. This is what it feels like to meet a doppelganger. One man said to have suffered such a fate was Percy by Shelley in 1812. The husband of Frankenstein's author Mary Shelley was a poet in his own right and enjoyed a joyous life. That was until he came face to face with his doppelganger, not once, but often and every time he did so, it would ask him the same thing. How long do you expect to be content? No one knew what this could mean or how to stop it, but one day it did, with no explanation as to why. That was until a letter arrived pronouncing Percy dead, having drowned at sea. Whilst most tales of these reflections do not end on a pleasant note, or teach of how to avoid such a fate, the tale of the doppelganger who came to Whitby does both. One day, a Guysborough man was walking down the cobbled street when his eyes fixed on a silhouette stood at the end of his path. As he walked closer to the figure, it too walked closer to him, until he found himself face to face with himself. However, this man did not react in fear or panic, for he had heard of tales of such reflections as well as a way to stop them. Therefore, he stood tall, facing his evil twin head on and shouted, What's thou doing here? Thou's after no good, before carrying on to demand the double be on his way. In response to being challenged, the doppelganger retracted the smile from his face, knowing that it had lost its chance to claim the man's soul. So, if you find yourself in this situation, confront the reflection and send it on its way, just like the Guysborough man in Whitby. The Salter's Gate Inn As a tourist town, Whitby sees many visitors passing through. While many are lovely, eccentric and welcomed, the town isn't exempt from unpleasant guests. One such guest came to Whitby for only one night, but may very well return if the 200-year flame burning at the Salters Gate Inn goes out. Standing on a road referred to as the Devil's Elbow, along the whole of Hawkram, stands the remains of this legendary inn. Well known for its lively atmosphere and numerous mentions in many horror stories, the inn is famous for its history in smuggling, and the fire that burnt for 200 years. Said to have been lit to welcome travellers at all hours of the day by some, 
The fire was also rumoured to have been used to warn smugglers when it was safe to enter. When the coast was clear, the fire was lit and smugglers could enter the inn to deposit their wares. However, when a police officer was in the area, the flame was extinguished and the smugglers knew to flee the area to avoid being caught. However, though smugglers are unwanted guests to many, they are not the guest that locals believe the fire was lit for, and are not the reason it burnt for 200 years. The local story occurred when the inn was known as the Wagon and Horses Inn, and attracted all manner of patrons, seeking a beer, a warm fire on a cold night, or a place to rest on a long journey. One night, during a heavy rainstorm, a most unsavoury character arrived at the inn's doors, hoping to seek refuge in its warmth. Pushing open the heavy door, he took one step inside, before a man at a nearby table jumped to his feet. All idle chatter halted, and everyone turned to see the priest on his feet, shouting at the man in the doorway, claiming to know of the evil lurking in his presence, and exclaiming to the pub that the devil was before them. To hearing such claims, the man in the doorway smiled, and took another step inside, confirming the priest's claims were true. The priest frantically began chanting Bible verses in order to banish the devil. However, the devil merely laughed. The priest's exorcism was ineffective. As people's eyes darted between the two and sought reassurance from those around them, the priest shook with fear, while the devil merely laughed. Suddenly, footsteps sounded from behind the bar as the landlord walked towards the men. For he had watched the scene unfold and bravely strode over to intervene. Some say the landlord then set the devil on fire using peat, while others suggest that he set a fire and that the devil was caught in the smoke. In each version, however, it was the landlord who set the now famous fire to remove the devil from his pub. This is why it is believed that if the fire goes out, the devil will return to Whitby and to the Salter's Gate Inn, seeking revenge by wreaking havoc on the locals, with no priest able to stop him. Genie of Biggersdale Unwanted guests are commonplace in any tourist town and in folklore. However, sometimes the townsfolk and ordinary humans are in fact the unwanted guests. Nestled in the Mulgrave woods is Hob Cave, where no one is welcome. This dark cave at the head of the dell, masked in shrubbery, is the home of Jeannie. Described as a particularly bad-tempered fairy, protective of her privacy, Jeannie became the focus of local gossip, claiming she was the reason behind many local misfortunes suffered by the local farmers. However, such rumours did not bother Jeannie. In fact, she was grateful for them. As rumours made her feared amongst the townsfolk, who believed if they were to disturb her, she would unleash her anger onto them, with some claiming she would curse or even kill those who did so. This meant that they left Jeannie alone, just as Jeannie liked it. However, while these rumours kept most away, they intrigued others. As a result, dares were challenged and bets were made for brave souls to tempt their fate and go to Hobbs Cave and call for Jeannie of Biggersdale. Naturally, most backed out as soon as they saw the dark entrance of the hole before them. But not everyone. An Eskdale farmer made one such wager on a night in a local pub and after a few pints of liquid courage, he readied his horse and set off into the Mulgrave woods. Filled with adrenaline, the farmer scanned the tree line for Jeannie's dwelling, calling out her name in drunken slurs. Until finally, he caught sight of the dark opening of a cave with disturbed shrubbery before it. Knowing this to be the fairy's dwelling, he called, Jeannie of Biggersdale, one last time demanding she reveal herself. Unfortunately, she was home. 
Thinking the rumour to be just that, he chuckled to himself, though he soon stopped, and from the darkness came a disturbing voice soaked in anger. I'm coming. The farmer froze, suddenly sober, his face pale and his hands shaking in fear. Then, he saw movement in the darkness. Without a moment's hesitation, the farmer pulled at his horse's reins, telling him to retreat. As the horse turned, running back through the forest, the farmer heard the sound of wings not too far behind him. Turning his eyes, they met Jeannie's, for the fairy was hot on his trail, her wings flapping violently and her arms stretched out ready to grab him. The farmer frantically willed his horse to run faster, but Jeannie was quicker. Fearing he'd fall victim to the fairy's wrath, the farmer became filled with hope when a river became visible along the path. This was his last chance to escape the fairy, for he knew no denizen of the other world can cross running water. Taking the leap across the river, the farmer prayed to be spared, and he was. He was thrown to the ground on the other side, out of reach of Jeannie, and laid next to him was the head and front two legs of his horse. What the farmer did not realise until now was that Jeannie was close enough to grab the rear half of his horse, and in a way unknown to him, severed the horse in two. There, in the water, was the other half of his horse, and behind it stood a ferocious genie making her way back to her cave. The events from that night were soon added to the tale of genie told by locals, finding its way into future books such as Catherine Simpson's 1893 book, Genie, A Biggersdale, in which tales of her malevolent deeds span 52 pages. With as many tales as there were being told about the fairy in Hob Cave, it wouldn't be hard to believe no one dared go near it again. But that isn't true, as not everyone who approached the cave did so on a dare. One lad who didn't was John Rowe. Unlike everyone else who did not believe the tales about Jeannie, Rowe did in fact believe in Jeannie, but not in how she was portrayed. In fact... Roe believed Jeannie to be a beautiful fairy and a good person inside. It was his belief that she just needed someone to love her and for her to love to cure her foul temper. Believing he could be such a person, Roe mounted his horse one evening after work and set off into Mulgrave Woods to find the fairy. Unsure of the exact location of her home, he searched the woods until he came across the narrow ravine not far from the old ruined castle. There, he dismounted his horse to scramble his way along it. After some time, he finally caught sight of the large cave with remnants of a fire, disturbed shrubbery and other indicators that someone lived inside. Excited, Ro made his way into the mouth of the cave anticipating the sight of a beautiful fairy awaiting him. This did not happen, however, but what walked towards him from the shadows was not what he had imagined, but a hairy creature shrieking. Ro bolted out of the cave. However, like everyone who crossed her path, Jeannie chased after him, scratching and clawing at the horse's hind quarters as she did so. Just like the farmer, Ro leapt over the water and was tossed to the ground on the other side. But Jeannie killed his horse with a spell from her wand and sent it falling into the beck. In this tale, however, Ro was not yet safe, and Jeannie did not turn back. She glided across the water, shrieking at him as he got up and ran for his life. He was only safe when he reached his farm. It took many days for Roe to be able to tell his story, and when he did, it was added to the long list of warning tales of Jeannie of Biggersdale. So please, never go searching for Jeannie.
Wade the Giant. Cliff faces and moorland are sights of beauty in and around Whitby, and it is not hard to believe that many strange and unusual beings live amongst them. One strange and beautiful sight to see is a six-foot-tall stone that has stood in an East Barnby field for centuries. While there is nothing to distinguish it from other standing stones found up and down this country, and many others around the world, it does have a name. This is Wade's Stone, and about 20 yards away from it is another standing stone with the same name. These stones mark the alleged grave of a beloved figure in local folklore, Wade the Giant. Said to have lived on the North Yorkshire Moors centuries ago were Wade and his giantess wife, Belle, who lived in a castle nine minutes from Whitby, near Leith, and are accredited for the creations of many of Yorkshire's beautiful sites. For one is said to have built Old Mulgrave Castle, and the other to have built Pickering Castle, with only one hammer between them. However, this did not stop them from carrying out such projects at the same time. Instead, they would throw the hammer to one another, giving a warning call each time to avoid any accidents. The two were a great team who loved each other deeply. All they needed was each other. This saw them live a quiet life upon the beautiful moors, where they raised cattle. After seeing his wife struggle to bring the cows in for milking, due to the many dips and hills in the landscape, Wade built her a road over the moors. When it was finished, the road crossed some of the highest and wildest parts of the moors, stretching from Moulton to the sea. It can still be seen today on a Wheeldale moor and is lovingly referred to as Wade's Causeway. As Wade helped Belle, Belle helped Wade. She would carry stones to him in her apron for his builds to save him the hassle of travelling back and forth. One day, wanting to save herself a later trip, Belle carried a larger load in her apron. This load was too heavy, however, and as she walked, the strings of her apron snapped, sending the stones falling across the moors. The remnants of this accident remain scattered across the moors today. While the loving couple helped each other greatly, and were very fond of one another, it did not mean they never disagreed. In fact, they once had a blazing row that changed the landscape forever. This is because, during the argument, Wade scooped up a large handful of earth and threw it at Belle. The hole this made in the earth was enormous, and formed a natural amphitheatre 400 foot deep and half a mile wide, now referred to as the Hall of Hawkram, a famous feature on the North Yorkshire Moors. Even the finger marks made while he scooped up the earth can still be seen nearby. This handful of earth missed Bell and fell to the ground to form the nearby outcropping now known as Blakely Topping meaning the row created a distinctive change in the moors that can be traced by a five-mile walk from the Saltersgate car park today. So next time you're walking near the moors, look out for the giant's creations and pay Wade Stone a visit. Now you know its secrets. <laughs>